This is NASA TV. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm Dan Hewitt, and I am joined today by Crew 5, recently returned back to planet Earth. Just to my left, we have JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata, recently wrapping up more than 500 days career in space. NASA astronauts Josh Cassida and Nicole Mann, and all the way on the end there, Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. They are excited to answer your questions. We're going to be taking them from reporters on the phone bridge and from social media. If you're on the phone bridge, press star one to get into the queue. And since we're doing this virtually, please let us know who you're asking your question to. And if you're on social media, head over to Twitter and use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll get to as many as we can today. So we are going to jump right in to questions. So off and running, we're going to start off on our phone bridge. Let's go first to Marvin Marshall with the nighttime news. Marvin. Nothing yet. OK, I'm going to. Sounds like we just lost our phone line, so I'm going to start off while we get that reconnected. Uh, this one for I'll start with Koichi. You've ridden back now in multiple different spacecraft. How did Dragon compare to some of your other re-entries back home to Earth? Each and every uh, spacecraft has its own uh, uniqueness, and uh, I really enjoyed this uh, fully, almost fully automated uh, aspect of the spacecraft, and uh, it's a really a smooth ride up and down. And uh, one of the, the you know, different things that I saw on the spacecraft, the Dragon, is uh, during the re-entry, I was able to see the, uh, the plasma of the, uh, during the atmosphere entry. So we had uh, like a fire work and then with the glow of the air for a long time. So I was able to enjoy the light show during the entry. It was really impressive. And then for my three first time flyers, what's, I mean, what's that one thing that really stands out in your mind that you took away from spending? You were up there 157 days. What's maybe one day that if anyone asks you, what did you do up there? What do you remember? What's the first thing that pops into your mind? Josh, we'll start with you. Uh, boy, that is a tough one to narrow it down uh, to one. Um, but I think the top two that, uh, that immediately come to mind, uh, one was late in the mission. Uh, I thought I was up earlier than everybody else, and I went to go use the restroom, and it turns out I was at least second, because Duke was down in the cupola. Um, and I heard her down there, she called me down, and uh, we saw the most incredible aurora. Um, it was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, we just went in there, and I'm, I'm sorry, it seemed a little selfish, but we just absorbed it. Um, we didn't have the have the skill set yet. We hadn't uh, consulted with Kuichi about uh, getting uh, some photography done uh, in that setting, um, but we just kind of hung out in there, and it was just so powerful. Uh, we did get some great shots the next day, um, but I really think that first day was uh, just uh, just breathtaking. Um, and then in terms of uh, professional satisfaction, um, for me, it was uh, our second spacewalk. Uh, for me and Frank, when we went out the door, uh, when we came back in, um, it was just this, this overwhelming feeling of everybody had done their job. Uh, Duke had just done such an amazing job getting us out the door. Uh, Koichi flying me around and putting me where I needed to be to get the job done. Uh, the teams on the ground, uh, just absolutely flawless execution. Um, and we only could do it because everybody did their job incredibly well. Um, and that, I wasn't expecting that kind of emotional reaction. Um, the nice thing is uh, tears don't run down your cheeks in space, so I, <laughs> we just called it allergies when I was in the airlock and we had gotten the work done and our, our uh, flight director Zeb uh, Scoville got on the loops and uh, kind of put it all in perspective. So those are the two big ones that pop out for me. All right, Nicole. Those were two big ones, I totally agree, and it's, it's tough to choose. I think one thing that was interesting for me is towards the end of the mission, I went back and I read my journal from the beginning of the mission, like that first week. And it was so cool to, to remind myself of that perspective that I had those first couple days in space, that first time floating around in zero G and, and, uh, and seeing everybody. It's something that I don't think you take for granted, but you get used to. You get used to looking out the window and seeing our beautiful planet. You get used to just floating around and tossing an M&M you know, to your friends uh, when you're eating. Uh, and so it was fun to, to kind of 
go back and reflect on what that feeling was like in the very beginning. And then when Crew 6 arrived, it was cool to see it through their eyes for that first time. You know, when you get out there and you're floating around and you're kind of unsure and you're, and you're unsteady, uh, and to see how quickly they, Crew 6 was adapting, to see how quickly they were picking up on you know, all the maintenance tasks and all the daily tasks that we were covering during handover. Uh, you can see that, that journey in yourself and, and in your crewmates, how much you change uh, during that time and how you adapt. And it was uh, really uh, nice, I think, just to take a moment and to appreciate that and have that perspective. All right, now, Anna, favorite memory. Ну, первое, что меня поразило и впечатлило, когда я оказалась на станции, это то, вот как только мы прошли через вестибюль и оказались в станции, что это действительно все реально. Это существует. Второе, что меня а, впечатлило, когда мы оказались на российском сегменте, я полностью увидела, что максимальное соответственное, соответствие с макетами, на которых мы проходили подготовку. Как будто я оказалась в тренажерах. И это меня очень порадовало. Все выглядело знакомо. И... Well, I will start with the first thing that really impressed and surprised me when I got onto the ISS right when I flew through the vestibule is that it's really real. It exists. <laughs> Here it is. And uh, the second thing is when we got to the Russian segment and I saw everything, I realized that it matches perfectly all of our mock-ups and of all of our simulators. And it was really comforting and reassuring because it was like I was seeing something that I heard already knew, something that was familiar. А дальше время просто за практикой. Нам очень здорово ребята предыдущие передали смену, все показали, рассказали. И мы с нашими ребятами, нашим экипажем прекрасно влились в работу. И дальше дело за малым. Просто делать от начала и до конца. И действительно, наше расписание было спланировано с самого раннего утра и до позднего вечера. Работы было очень много, как по обслуживанию систем станции, так и всевозможные эксперименты и дополнительные работы. And then the next thing, we just had to practice. So the handover was very smooth. The previous crew really told us how to do everything, explained the ropes, showed us everything, and then we just had to dive into it and begin doing it. And we did it, and we did it well, and it was a really smooth transition. And from morning till evening, every minute of the day was planned out for us. There was a whole lot to do, including both servicing the station and performing all of the experiments. All right, thank you, Crew 5. Now, we're gonna see if we've mastered this whole phone technology. We're gonna give it one more shot. Let's start with Marvin Marshall with the nighttime news. Marvin. Awesome, thank you very much, Dan. Can you guys hear me? Gotcha. Gotcha loud and clear. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, good afternoon. I'm Marvin Marshall from the Nighttime News at Space Report on Twitch TV. Um, this my, my question is for uh, all of you guys here. Uh, could each of you share a hilarious moment? <laughs> hilarious moment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, every moment was a hilarious moment, but uh, for me, uh, I, w I found out that those guys are really, you know, test pilots and engineers, but the, they are really good at the cooking in zero gravity. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we are having uh, some holidays, uh, uh, you know, Josh was really good at uh, cutting the cheese for pizza, and Nicole was uh, making uh, adobo with the, all the, uh, uh, the dried meat and stuff like that. And Anya is a really great cook of uh, Olivia salad, and I was really good at eating all of them. <laughs> but I was really impressed with their technique of all the zero-G cooking. So that was a very hilarious moment that I experienced. Uh, the moment that I remember, uh, we laughed really hard when we were up there. Uh, <laughs> one of the ones that uh, sticks in my mind, um, the uh, NG-18, the Northrop Grumman uh, cargo vehicle that came up, has hundreds, if not thousands, of these gold carabiners uh, that are used to, uh, to stage the, the cargo. Um, and they're super useful, so we end up using them on the station uh, for our own purposes. Um, and there was a day, uh, you remember when Frank was working in Node 1, um, and he had a kind of frustrating task that he was working on. And uh, the ground was uh, had a camera looking over his shoulder, which he loves uh, <laughs> to have uh, more cooks in the kitchen. And um, 
what happened was one of the one of the carabiners had gotten away, and he was dealing with something else. And it is not a big deal. We can we can go find that. Uh, but they alerted him to the fact that he had lost a carabiner, and that was not what he wanted to deal with at that moment. So I took it upon myself uh, about 10 minutes later just to sit in the lab, and I took a gold carabiner and I just sent it <laughs> his direction at about you know three centimeters a second. And he just continues to work, and somehow he had just moved his head enough that it grazed the back of his hair, but he didn't feel it. <laughs> and the ground lost their mind again, and started yelling, and he's looking around, and I'm laughing so hard because he has no idea where it came from. Um, and so I was the only one who knew where it was. So I grabbed it, and I showed the, uh, showed the ground that I had, uh, I had solved their problem, and uh, Frank was 0 for 2, and he couldn't explain to them that I was just messing with him. <laughs> That was kind of a recurring theme, Josh messing with us um, when we were in space. We did laugh a lot. It's hard to choose just one, but I do remember one time we were getting ready, our suits ready for our EVA for Koichi and I uh, to get ready to go out the door. And I had uh, sized the suit and I put my boots in and I have small feet relative to the size of the EMU uh, feet. And so I have these inserts that go inside there, but I wasn't able to push it in very good with my hand. So I was like, okay, I need to just get my foot in there to push um, this insert all the way into the boot because you want it to fit properly. You don't want to deal with it day of. So I'd say, hey, this is my plan. I'm just gonna you know, put the, uh, the lower torso on, push my feet in so everything fits fine. You know, Josh says, hey, do you need help? You good? I was like, oh no, I got it. Like, I'm totally good. Okay, he floats away. So I'm in the airlock. I get the lower uh, torso on, I get my feet in, I get it all situated. Hey, everything's feeling good, perfect. And then I go, uh-oh. <laughs> like it's really hard to get out of that lower torso and you don't have anything to push against and we're usually never getting out of the suit by ourselves. So I realized very quickly, I'm stuck in my pants and um, Josh has already floated away. I don't see Frank. I'm like, oh man, what am I gonna do? So I poke out, Koichi's way down, other end of the lab, down in no two, Koichi. Koichi, you know, I'm yelling at his loud on station. He looks, I say, I'm stuck in my pants. And I don't know if I, you know, I'm speaking quickly or maybe his, you know, primary language is Japanese, but he's like, what? Now, Koichi, I'm stuck in my pants. I need your help. And so fortunately he helped me get out of my pants. So thanks. <laughs> У меня был забавный случай. Я на, с собой в космос брала э, символ моего города Новосибирск, э, городовичок, маленький мальчик, куколка. И я их брала три разных. Одного я сразу забрала с собой на станцию, а двоих с корабля я сразу не забрала. Аня. I had a funny situation. When I went to space, I brought the symbol of my city, Novosibirsk. It's this little doll. Actually, I brought three of them. And the first one I took immediately with me to station, and the other two I left in the vehicle for a little bit. И после этого я вернулась в корабль искать их и не нашла. После этого я еще два раза в течение миссии пыталась их найти. Не нашла. Я искала во всех вещах, которые у меня были вокруг моей каюты, везде, где только можно. В итоге за всю миссию, за всю нашу продолжительную миссию, я их не нашла и уже мысленно распрощалась с ними. And so I went back to the Soyuz to get the other two when I wanted to have them, and they weren't there. And I looked everywhere, I looked in all of my things, I looked around my crew quarter. I looked and looked and looked and I came back several times throughout the duration of the mission and I just couldn't find them anywhere. And mentally I said farewell to them. <laughs> yes. And finally, uh, ой, и в конечном счете, когда мы собирались домой, мы уже были в корабле, сняли скафандры и собирались спать, уходить в сон. Достали спальные мешки. И вот они мои два городовичка. Они все это время спали в спальном мешке. Всю миссию они нашлись, и они вернулись со мной на землю. We undocked, got ready to sleep, pulled out our sleeping, bag, sleeping bags, and there they were. There they were, my two little dolls. They were sleeping the whole increment. They slept through it all. Well, I found them, and I brought them back home with me. I'm, I'm glad you tracked them down. All right. Next up on the phone, we got Bill Harwood with CBS News. Bill. Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, yeah, I've, I've just been curious for, for every crew, crew Dragon Landing. Can, can two of you maybe describe the sensations after five months in weightlessness or six months? Uh, when you hit the water 
and the things even in a gentle swell. Is that disorienting for you? That's number one. What's that like getting back on the boat? And number two, just can can you talk a little bit about uh, what's been a surprise about your readaptation to gravity? I mean, astronauts have been doing this for quite a while, cosmonauts, but uh, has it gotten any better? Does it still take about a month to get your legs back and, and, and not be disoriented? Just how's all that going? Thanks. We're at, what, four days right now? Mm -hmm. Do we share the secret with them? Sure, go ahead. Gravity is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> After being in zero G, you come back to gravity and you're thinking, this is going to be great. It is not great. Um, <laughs> it takes you a while to, to adapt. Uh, you know, we have trainers that help us so, you know, with our strength and the balance, but I think we're four days into it. We're still a little bit, um, a little bit wobbly. Um, but I think um, to your first question, coming downhill, really the landing wasn't that significant. Um, but feeling G for the first time. So when we start re-entry, we have a G meter, we could see the G rise. And uh, we all commented, okay, we're here we are, we're at half a G, it's starting to rise. And like half a G, holy smokes. It felt like somebody was sitting on your chest and pushing you down, you're only at half a G. And so by the time we were at 4.5 Gs, you're really getting smooshed into that seat. You're really focusing on, on just breathing. You can feel your tongue in the back of your, of your throat. And it's just amazing because it's so powerful and so strong. Um, even though you know that that's going to be the profile, it's still amazing. Um, and then the drugs coming out and the shoots coming out, those were, those are pretty dynamic events and you're really swaying around. So by the time you get the splashdown, it's just poof, you know, you splash down. You are, we had calm seas and light winds, but you get a little bit of a Dutch roll kind of going on. Um, and so you can definitely, definitely feel that. And it definitely made me feel a little bit, bit tumbly. Uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, Nicole's right. The, the G's are a little uh, surprising, I mean, even if you're ready for them. Um, but uh, in, I took it upon myself to kind of keep everybody aware of what the G's were as we were all doing our own different tasks, but just to kind of let them know where we are and where we're headed. And I remember calling out, you know, four and a half G's or so. And for me, it was really strange. My inner ear started doing its thing that it hadn't done in uh, almost a hockey season. And so um, I noticed that I had to like lock into the frame of the uh, of the display, and my eyes kind of did this. It was like the Matrix. It was like a glitch glitch in the Matrix where uh, I would tumble maybe five degrees and then instantaneously end back up, and then tumble five degrees, and, and just kept doing this like every two to three seconds, and uh, that lasted until we were back down to probably about two and a half or so. Um, so thank goodness it wasn't permanent. Um, but uh, I, I agreed that you know it was. Uh, it felt to me it. It felt very similar to uh, what you would experience in a ride that was trying to simulate a, a re-entry. You know, the, the sounds of the vehicle, I thought, well, that clearly somebody's playing a, an audio loop, right? This isn't actually what it sounds like, but it, it does. It sounds just like uh, doing a, a ride at, uh, at a big amusement park. At least that's what it felt like to me. All right, next up, we're gonna go to Elizabeth Howell with space.com, Liz. Hello, welcome home. Um, this one's for Nicole. Do you mind reflecting a little bit upon your journey that brought you to be the first Native American woman in space and how uh, while you were up there, you were trying to talk to various groups um, to inspire the next generation? Thanks. Absolutely. You know, my journey, I think, is, is one that kind of uh, evolved as I grew. And so I didn't have it all figured out when I was young and I didn't know um, you know, really what it meant to be an astronaut, who became an astronaut, or how that even um, was possible. And so it wasn't until later on in life that I really started considering that career path and looking at the different opportunities. Uh, so I think it's really important um, for all of us astronauts to share our journey. Uh, we all have unique journeys on how we became an astronaut. Uh, we have all unique dreams and aspirations. But the one thing that we all share in common is that we're very passionate about what our, our jobs were prior to becoming an astronaut. We're very passionate about the work that we do on board the International Space Station. And so that communication of our journey and our excitement and our love for what we do, I think is very important to help inspire the next generation. If a young child can look up at you know, at the screen and see us floating and see us sharing our stories, whether you come from Russia or Japan or the North or, or California, wherever your background is, whatever your race, your religion, anything, you can, you can share in that joy and maybe you see something in that astronaut that's sharing their story, uh, something that you connect with. And maybe that's the one thing that will help motivate a child to, 
to reach for those dreams. Maybe that's the one thing that will give them that additional discipline they need to not only establish that dream, but then go out and be successful in, in conquering that dream. So I think that's something that we all share in common and it's very important. Thank you, Nicole. All right, we're gonna jump over to a couple of questions from social media real quick. This first one I'm gonna to give to Koichi. This comes from a woo woo. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, we've heard food tastes different once you're in space. Is your mind flipped? Does food taste different once you come back to Earth? Actually, that's a really good question. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I think uh, you know, uh, food did not taste differently in space in zero gravity mm. uh, on my short and long flights. And uh, uh, this time, of course, I long for fresh food when I came back. Uh, the food in space, space station is really good. But uh, we really have fresh food, like salad and stuff. And I was really longing for sushi, so I asked my wife to bring sushi <laughs> to the Kukoras when we get back to when we got back to Houston, and it was really good. So um, for the first time in five more than five months, I had sushi, and it was great. And I wish in the very near future we have something like that in zero gravity in space station, and I hope it's happening. On the to-do list for the food lab. Uh, <laughs> all right, this next one I'm going to give to Anna. This one's from Eeyore. Um, since returning to Earth. Have you dropped anything on the ground unconsciously, thinking that it should, that it should have floated? Да, похожая ситуация была. Я подошла, если это можно так сказать, к столу взять виноградинку с тарелки. И каково было мое удивление, когда вместо одной виноградинки я стянула целую гроздь, и вместе с этой гроздью у меня рука просто упала на стол. И там уже какими-то движениями я оторвала себе эту маленькую виноградинку. Yeah, I had something similar happen. I came up to the table to grab a grape from the table. And imagine my surprise when by grabbing one, I ended up grabbing a whole patch of grapes. And then my hand just fell onto the table instead of gently lifting everything. So then I had to work my hand up and work the one grape off the rest. And only then I was able to go free. <laughs> All right, this next one I'm going to give to Josh. Uh, so this is from Roger. He said he was waving to you from the beach and wanted to know if you could see him. Uh, Roger, I was waving at you. I don't know. We, our windows are smaller, so you <laughs> might not have seen me. Uh, uh, so we did, you know, uh, Quichi's right. Uh, the, the view was incredible on the reentry of that plasma, right? That soup of ions and doing its thing. Uh, I actually thought these colors, I, I wasn't expecting those. I mean, we saw pink, we saw green, we saw bluish kind of at some point. Um, it was uh, it was really something. And so, Roger, I'm not sure that I actually did see you. I tried. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I'm going to send this one to Nicole. What was the most challenging aspect of living and working in space for five months, and how do you overcome that? Velcro. Oh. Definitely Velcro. Um, <laughs> it's your best friend and it's your worst friend, all in, all in the same day, I gotta be honest. Like sometimes you just need Velcro, the good Velcro that works when you stick something there, it actually stays, even if it gets bumped a little bit and you know, all Velcro is not created equal. So sometimes that Velcro is very strong and sticky um, when you need it to. And then other times, you know, in station, there's areas where it's a little bit older and so it doesn't do as good of a job. And then there's the Velcro. Anya will, will appreciate this with me. It grabs your hair every time you float by. So you have your hair back and it's the strong Velcro, especially in the airlock that gets you and you'll be floating and it will literally like stop you, <laughs> your movement and you pull back and you're like, uh, oh, and your hair comes uh, out with Velcro. So, I know Josh and Koichi, I don't, you don't think you had the hair Velcro situation, but I know that you realized the look on my face that I just got Velcroed, and, and I think we all kind of shared that a little bit. And, and the station is a big place, and so it actually really helped me and Koichi uh, keep track of where Nicole was, <laughs> so we could actually just follow her path. Um, and then she'd be whimpering a little bit <laughs> at, at the end of that path. But yeah, we, uh, we knew where you were, mm -hmm. where you had been. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a couple more from our phone line. Let's go to Marsha Smith with Space Policy Online. Marsha. Uh, thanks so much for taking my question. I'm curious for the three of you who have been out on spacewalks. You know, you've had these two incidents now where the Soyuz and the Progress might have been hit by micrometeorites or space debris or something. When you go out on a spacewalk and you look back at the space station, are you surprised to see how many things there are in it? 
And, I mean, do you look at it and you say, oh, gosh, look at all that? Or, or is it like, are you alarmed? If, how many hits there have been? How worrisome is it that there's so much debris up there? Personally, I was feeling lucky, and it worked out pretty well. Um, uh, we do see some evidence when we're out there, um, and we are we are trained extensively to uh, to not let the evidence, you know, that what's you know sometimes these handrails can be uh, have burrs on them, and that's a real problem if we were to cut our suit. Um, so yeah, it it definitely does happen. Um, I certainly didn't see anything actively happen while I was out there. Um, we've got uh, such an amazing system and the people running the system uh, that if something like that should happen, um, more likely than not, uh, you know, we would be able to uh, get ourselves back to the, to the airlock. The, the system is, is going to maintain uh, the pressure uh, unless it's uh, something catastrophic, but uh, that isn't happening very often. Uh, I actually saw no evidence of that while I was out there, any, any big holes. So, um, and we're trained uh, on how to, how to deal with that. Uh, we've got emergency procedures, uh, just like flying in an aircraft. Um, so, you know, I think in line with everything else we do, uh, we plan for all the worst situations, and when those don't happen, um, it works out really well. And if it, you know, if we do have to fall back on our training, it just becomes second nature. So, um, I wasn't terribly worried. There's, I think we're more worried about messing something up while we're out there uh, than something uh, maybe fairly low pro uh, probability like that. All right. Next up, we have Yusuke Toniyama with Yumi. Yomiyuri Shumbum, Yusuke, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, Yusuke Tomiyama, the Yomiyuri Shumbum Japanese Daily. So my question is to Akatsu-san. Uh, you marked fifth space flight on this crew five mission. It's the highest record among Japanese astronauts. Let me ask you your next goal. So do you want to fly to the space more? How about your ambition on lunar mission? Thank you. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Of course, uh, space is my passion, and uh, as far as I can fly, I would like to, you know, keep flying. But uh, you know, Furuka-san, uh, Satoshi Furuka, is uh, flying uh, um, on the crew seven, and I would like to uh, support his uh, training and then flight. And also, we have selected new uh, JAXA candidates, um, so I would like to help support um, their uh, training and mission and then uh, utilizing my uh, uh, experience of training and also space flight. So uh, after that, uh, if there's any chance, of course, I would like to be involved in this, uh, any of the activities in human space flight, no matter where the destination will be. Thank you. All right, next up, Nikio Tanabe with NHK. Nikio. Hi, thank you for taking my question. So my question is for Wakata-san. So I'm just wondering what your emotion was at the moment when the Crew Dragon splashed down. When the hatch of the Crew Dragon was open, you looked smiling and talked something with the grand staff. What did you talk about? And I'd also like to ask about your future. What do you, uh, what do you want to do after you return to Japan? Can you tell us about your professional and private life? Thank you. Okay, what do I want to do after I return to Japan? That's a good question I have to think about. I think I still eat have sushi. some time. <laughs> yeah, eat sushi, the good sushi, and then uh, good ramen noodles, and uh, uh, especially in, uh, you know, my uh, uh, time in the Fukuoka, I really have good the memory of having good ramen there, so I really like to do that. And uh, beyond that, uh, it's still, I would like to think about, but uh, definitely I uh, would like to be involved in uh, human space exploration, uh, utilizing my experience. and. Uh, I, at, at the touchdown, I really felt, uh, you know, what happened in the last five months was really in a dream. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to have accomplished uh, so many things uh, with a great crew, with a real can-do crew here. And on board the space station, we have cr our crewmates on board the station, the Expedition 68 crew. We have encountered uh, actually a lot of issues, technical uh, challenges, that, but we coped with all of these with the support of the ground people. And that's uh, what human space exploration is all about. Uh, with the great teamwork, we will be able to overcome the difficulties that we face, and we achieve so many things uh, in the utilization of the space station. So I hope uh, this uh, cooperation, collaboration, international collaboration, and also the commercial partners' uh, co collaboration will continue to expand our presence in the lower Earth orbit and to the Moon and Mars beyond. So I would like to be involved in this human space exploration no matter where I work, and that's my dream. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, looks like we're getting to a couple of follow-ups now. Let's go again to Marvin Marshall with Nighttime Space News. Marvin? 
Hi, thank you for taking another question. Uh, it's Marvin again here. Um, now, I'm curious, uh, and this is for, you know, Nicole or Josh uh, and whoever wants to chime in here. Um, how, uh, you know, how, how was the uh, sleeping aboard Dragon, and where, where did you guys all sleep? Uh, did, like, you guys sleep above the display? Where was your, uh, you know, sleeping positions? And, you know, I just want to apologize. My last question got cut off there. Um, but, you know, I really want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to NASA for allowing me this opportunity today. And welcome back to the incredible Crew-5 astronaut. Thank you again. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, sleeping a dragon was was pretty comfortable. I think the um, going up, uphill so far after launch, we had about 29 hours in dragon before we docked to the space station. We all slept in our seats. And I think I kind of, you know, I slept, but I would always wake up at every jet firing and sometimes turn on a display uh, just to be aware of what was going on. And it was all such a new environment. So um, it was a very light sleep, I would say. And then, um, at, towards the end of the mission, once crew six came on board, we turn over our crew quarters to the new crew. And then we're all kind of in a camp out state. So we move and sleep in a different location. Um, and I had the privilege of sleeping in Dragon during that time. And that was really special, very unique um, opportunity uh, for me. So it was about a week and I just slept in Dragon really underneath the seats with one bungee to keep me from floating around. Uh, you don't need the support of the seat or, or anything since you just float in space. Uh, but the one thing that was really a treat is that you can wake up in the morning, take the window shade off and drink your coffee and look out the window and just marvel at our beautiful planet. So watch the sunrise, watch the sunset. Uh, that was very, very unique. Um, and then coming back home, we, uh, uh, I slept underneath the seats again where I had slept uh, for the past week and everybody else slept in their seats. Again, I think we all kind of sleep for a couple hours and then you know, kind of wake up, think about where we're at, what's going on, kind of double check and then kind of go back to sleep. So I'd say in general it's comfortable, but your mind is not totally at rest because you're about to you know, return to the planet. So there's a lot going on up there. I don't remember the part where Anya woke up. No, that is, that is a true statement, she, yes. She's got some <laughs> Professional skills. Sleeper. It is incredible. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, let's go to Sophie Sanchez with Cosmic Chicago. Sophie. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about veggie. If I can get your um, experiences growing the plants on Earth, I'm um, sorry, in space. Um, I know that for the past veggie experiments, it was more to look at the tech demonstration that we could grow, how the tech and the um, habitats for the plants worked. But this um, time around um, for Veggie 5, you guys are supposed to be looking at the organoleptic assessment and reaction, um, how you guys interacted or felt growing the plants. Can you guys share a little bit about um, your own organoleptic assessments of um, growing plants in space? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I had a privilege to work on a veggie uh, experiment and it's space station inside that there's all like machines and computers and it's really uh, rare to see, you know, living creatures other than human beings. <laughs> so actually it's really soothing to, to, to be able to, you know, touch the living uh, things like plants. So uh, uh, we grew tomatoes uh, on the veggie five uh, mission and uh, every day, pretty much every day we, uh, uh, added water and uh, checked the condition of the uh, the plant, and uh, it was very soothing for me uh, to be able to 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 see that. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to eat it. But uh, uh, Frank and uh, crew members of uh, Crew Six, Expedition 68 to 69, will be able to harvest it, and I really envy. But I think uh, this kind of plant growing, uh, harvesting, is a very important thing for a long duration mission to to Mars in the in the near future. I hope. So I think we have been doing a, um, excellent um, experiments, uh, um, how to uh, grow in the hydroponic and uh, aeroponic uh, manner of the plants uh, for future exploration missions. And I was very fortunate to be able to participate in that experiment. Thank you, Koichi. Next up, let's go again to Elizabeth Howell with space.com. Liz. Thanks for finding me again. Um, this would be especially for Nicole and Anna, I suppose, but anybody can chime in. Can you just talk about the significance of uh, Women's History Month and about the contributions of diversity in making space a fairly awesome place? Thank you. Begin. Uh, of course. Uh, so I think it's important that we celebrate um, each type of unique event. Um, as I spoke to you before, it's really so that you can kind of share that journey and help inspire the younger generation. I think the, uh, the diversity that we have 
in the U.S. Astronaut Corps and in our international astronaut and cosmonaut corps is, is really incredible. It's a great reflection of the diversity that we have on planet Earth, and that's so important to recognize. Uh, we're, I think, getting to the point, too, where that is not really as much news as it used to be in the past, right? The, the fact that a, a woman was flying to a space or that a woman was doing a spacewalk, uh, you know, fortunately, we're, we're finally progressing, I think, enough to, to an era where that's common nature. Um, you're going to see with the Artemis mission, uh, when we go to the moon, you're going to see, you know, a women, you're going to see people of color, you're going to see all different types of people uh, be a part of that Artemis mission. And that is really reflecting who we are as a human species. Uh, and that includes all of our international partners as well. And so I see this as a, as a great uh, thing to celebrate. Of course, we're not totally there yet, right? There's still areas in the world, um, areas in the United States where we have barriers and, and we're working to overcome those. But it's great to also celebrate the progress that we've made where it is the, the capable and the certified that are selected uh, for a mission and to uh, execute that mission. Никол говорит абсолютно правильно. Я могу от себя добавить, что человечество на Земле представлено двумя полами, мужским и женским. И это нормально, когда э, два этих представителя человечества развиваются в космической отрасли и представляют ее в космосе. Мало того, что... Ань, давай. I fully subscribe to everything that Nicole says, and I would add that here on Earth we have two genders, and so it makes sense that representatives from both of them are up in space developing space and exploring space together. В каждом человеке все знают, есть определенное соотношение энергии и инь-янь, если мы говорим об этом. И в целом многие говорят и доказано, что наиболее полноценные рабочие команды и экипажи, и группы людей, где есть определенное соотношение как мужского, так и женского гендера, они друг друга уравновешивают, дополняют, украшают и более эффективный результат работы, когда идет она совместная. And there is this concept of the yin and the yang, and it is well known that different teams, groups, partnerships are at their best when there is a representation of the yin and the yang, of the female and of the male. Teams are more effective, they are more successful, and they are more productive as groups. Более того, если мы говорим о том, что идет вопрос развития человечества как в дальнейшем заселении каких-то других планет, переселения человечества, то мы должны готовить оба существа, как мужскую, так и женскую особь, к тому, чтобы они были готовы переместиться в дальний, участвовать в дальних, в длительных космических полетах на дальние планеты и быть способными и работоспособными к дальнейшему развитию и продолжению рода человечества. Поэтому оба пола необходимо, чтобы участвовали в космической программе. And if we're talking about developing humanity in other planets and extra long space travel to those other planets, then it makes all the more sense to prepare both men and women, males and females, to go to those planets, to be ready to be strong, to, be, to have high levels of endurance, so that they are functioning well when they reach those planets. And that's why it makes sense to have both representatives do space exploration. All right, thank you, Nicole and Anna. We got one more in the phone bridge, Marsha Smith from Space Policy Online again. Marsha. Well, thanks so much for taking a second question. Uh, mine is for Nicole. You gave that very entertaining story about your spacesuit incident. Earlier today, Axiom rolled out their prototype of their lunar spacesuit. And Collins, of course, is developing a new one for LEO. Uh, are you and the other astronauts being brought into the discussions on how to design these to make them easier to use? And what one piece of advice would you give them? So in general, yes, NASA is being consulted quite a bit on the development of the new spacesuits. And they're looking at you know, a wider range of of body types that can fit into these spacesuits, and rightfully so, because we are all unique and we have different heights and different widths, and it, so it's very important that we make a spacesuit that is adaptable, um, and so that you're able to function and get the the job done more effectively 
uh, in a spacesuit that can f that fits you personally and that is adaptable uh, to fit a variety of types of uh, people. Since we've been, you know, on board the International Space Station and just returning, I uh, have not personally been involved. And uh, unfortunately, I was in testing this morning, so I didn't get to see the rollout of the new suit. But I know we're all very excited uh, for that suit. The, the EMU is a great suit, um, but it is some antiquated technology. And so I think what we'll see with these next generation spacesuits are not only the ability to adapt to, to different body types, but also the use of you know, computers or, or imaging uh, that gives you more information to understand and easier to use that spacesuit um, for, for really everybody. And so this leap, next leap in a generation, I think will make our capabilities on EVA much more effective. All right, and one more on the phone bridge, Manuel Mazante with the Spacial. Manuel? Yes, thank you. How are you? Um, a question for anyone uh, of the crew. I, I, I'm curious to know um, how do you feel after splashdown? Because you guys not only have to adapt again to gravity after splashdown, but then you have the capsule moving along with the waves. And you have to be like one hour waiting until you are uh, retrieved out, out of the water. So I, I wonder if that does it make it even more difficult to adapt, or how do you guys feel during that hour inside the, the, the Crew Dragon? Thank you. Well, uh, that last hour was the, uh, what, the 30th hour? We'd essentially been awake, so we were pretty beat. Um, so uh, that was kind of a, a nice little uh, relaxing moment where we didn't have to do anything. Um, so uh, I would say that I was expecting it to be a little bit more uh, benign in terms of, uh, of the rolling waves. And I think they ended up being a little bit bigger than we, we had expected. Um, but personally, I, I felt fine. I didn't, I didn't feel sick. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was the first one to get moved out of the Dragon, um, apparently because I'm the biggest one on the crew, which just says we have a small crew if I'm the biggest guy. Um, so uh, we have some incredible uh, people uh, who are taking care of us. Uh, most of them are former PJs from the U.S. Air Force. Um, and so they came and moved me first, and uh, I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, that, that was probably one of the more exciting parts of the Dior, but they moved me pretty quickly. Um, and so uh, that, um, I moved, they got me where I needed to be because they're big and strong and they got me uh, right where I needed to be, and then when I went to get out, um, still feeling good, and the, the problem I had was my body really, really wanted to lean forward. And uh, it took a, a couple other big guys to make sure that I didn't do that uh, <laughs> a little too much. Um, but uh, that, that hour, uh, I actually enjoyed that. It was a nice little calm uh, respite before we got uh, back to, uh, to real civil civilization. All right, that's gonna do it for our phone bridge. Got a couple more on social before I let you guys free. Uh, this first one's from Dane for Koichi. Uh, where'd you get your sushi once you got back to NASA? Ooh. Actually, I have to ask my wife. But okay. It was really good. Uh, it's local in Houston. Okay. Yeah. Dane may or may not work for NASA, so that's <laughs> probably why that one came in. Um, and then for this one, we're, we're gonna we'll close on this one, but I'll ask uh, each of you. So aside from you know splashing down, getting on the boat, what's the first thing you did once you kind of got back and you had the freedom to do whatever you want? What's the first thing you did? First thing in. Uh, in the spacecraft or? No, so back back on Earth. Yeah. So you basically once you got back to Houston, you you had you had freedom to do whatever you wanted to do. What was the first thing you did? I think I took a shower and enjoyed the uh, water droplets really dropping because I have not seen that view for five months. It's kind of strange that the water doesn't stay here, but it drops. And then I really <laughs> enjoy that. I ate my body weight in Cheetos. <laughs> I was going to share them with my kids when I decided we'd do that some other time. It's impressive. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, the first afternoon that we had off, we had a little bit of a break. Uh, I got to play catch with the boys, and that was super fun. Um, the weather broke a little bit, and we got to play catch. So we joked before we left, like, how were you playing catch? Were you, did you make it all the way to the kids, or, or was your, your toss a little, so little messed up from These guys G? can verify. I never got good at throwing things in space, which meant <laughs> I was still able to play catch when I got back. All right. <laughs> That's a skill. Um, for me, it was that first hug with my husband and my son. And, you know, you thought about it, and I, you know, it's going to be great to see them. But the second I got that hug, I just held on for probably way too long. I don't know. It was the greatest feeling uh, in the world just to... Um, be connected with them in that way. You know, of course, we have pretty good connection with phone calls and some, 
you know, FaceTime type of, of audio visual calls. But really that first hug was, was special and uh, I'll always remember that. Ну, если говорить обо мне, как только мы добрались до места, где проводится реабилитация, я тоже думала, что первое, что я захочу, это принять нормальный душ, и чтобы вода сама сливалась с волос. Но оказалось, что самым прекрасным было лежать на боку и ничего не делать. And just to have all that water on its own drain away from my hair. But actually, it turned out that even more than that, I enjoyed just laying on my side and not doing anything. <laughs> all right. Well, that's going to do it for us. I want to thank everybody for calling in and sending your questions on social media. To Crew 5, welcome home. It's great to see your smiling faces back here on planet Earth. And it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last couple of months while you were in space. Um, Obviously, their journey's done in space, but they've got a lot of work still to do on Earth. In fact, Josh, I don't know where your sunglasses were. I hope the lights aren't too bright. Uh, but, you know, a lot still ahead for them. But 157 days in space. They came home on Saturday. Really great to have you guys. Appreciate you coming and spending an afternoon with us. That is going to do it for us. Continue to follow all of our spaceflight action on NASA.gov and the commercial crew missions to the International Space Station. Uh, a lot more coming soon. That'll do it, though. So we'll say goodbye, good afternoon, and farewell. Thank you. Thank you.